My name is Melina Lavocan Massimo. I come from the community of Lower Buffalo and I'm a member of the Lubicon Cree First Nation. I'm also a climate and energy campaigner with Greenpeace Canada. The traditional territory of the Lubicon Cree covers approximately 10,000 square kilometers of low-lying trees, forests, rivers, plains, wetlands, what we call muskeg, and it's in northern Alberta. My community has dealt with three decades of massive oil and gas development, and this has been without the consent of the people or without the recognition or protection of the human rights, which should be protected under Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, which protects Aboriginal and treaty rights. In the 70s, before this type of encroachment on the land and development happened, my father's generation was living sustenance living with my grandparents where they actually hunted and fished and trapped um, throughout the region, throughout the traditional territory. Back then, and you know, even into my generation, um, I remember going on the trap line and going out on the horse and wagon. People were still living off the land, the water still was good to drink, but as oil and gas came through the territory, it's changed a lot. Currently, there's more than 2,600 oil and gas wells in our traditional territories. 1,400 square kilometers of leases have been granted for in-situ oil sands development in Lubicon territory, and almost 70% of Lubicon territory has been leased for future development. So what we see is an indigenous way of life being overshadowed by intensive oil and gas development. We see, you know, where there once was self-sufficiency in the communities, in the region, you know, because there was clean air, clean water, medicines, berries, and plants from the boreal. Um, we see this changing, you know, with an increased dependency on um, social services because families are not able to sustain themselves in what was once a healthy environment. And what else we also see is health concerns, respiratory illnesses because of the noxious gases that are being released into the air and water. We see in the north elevated rates of cancers um, and then also lack of medical services. And it's been calculated that almost $14 billion has been taken out of our traditional territory in revenue for the oil and gas company and yet the resources don't go back into the community and this is very much you know a symptomatic problem that we see happening in a lot of indigenous communities across Canada where you know these are like one of the few last pristine ecosystems that are still living in Canada and yet the communities have to deal with the repercussions of contamination and what we see our way of life being replaced by is industrial landscapes polluted and drained watersheds and contaminated air so it's very much a crisis situation. On April 29th, 2011, there was a rupture in the Rainbow Pipeline, which resulted in a massive oil spill by our community. It was about 4.5 million liters. It was uh, one of the biggest um, oil spills in Alberta's history. What happened is the pipeline broke and leaked, and this oil went down the corridor and also into the forest but majority of it got soaked up into the muskeg which is like peatland moss which takes thousands of years to be generated and this is an issue because the muskeg is connected to all the water there it's not just an isolated system it's not quote stagnant water that the government tries to say that it is it's actually a living breathing ecosystem that supports life so the first day of the spill, the school actually didn't even know that there was an oil spill. Uh, so when the kids came to school that day, um, when people started feeling sick, they actually took the students outside of the school because they thought it was a propane leak. And when they got outside into the field, the principal said it was just as bad. They realized that it was all over in the community. It wasn't just inside the school. Um, so. They were very concerned and didn't receive the information that they should have. It took five days for the community to officially know the immensity of the spill. The school had to be shut down in the community for almost a week and a half. The first week of the spill, 
Community members were getting sick, their eyes were burning, people had headaches, people were feeling nauseous. Supposedly the, the air quality issues weren't a problem, even though Alberta Environment didn't actually come onto site into the community until six days after the spill. And this is very problematic um, because if the community is complaining about being sick, then the government who's giving these permits and allowing this type of development to even happen which is without the consent of the people in the community a lot of the times needs to take care of the people that you know it's putting their they're at direct risk a lot of people were left wondering what they should be doing left wondering if they should be even in the community um, you know if pregnant women should be in the community if small children it's a 45 year old pipeline and who knows what will happen in the future for other communities along this corridor. When the pipeline broke in 2006 and the EUB at the time had stated that there was stress and corrosion factors related to the pipeline's infrastructure, you know, a million liters were spilt. And now we see five years later, 4.5 million liters spilt in our traditional territory. When does it ever end? When does it ever stop? communities are going to have to be on watch because of pipeline breaks like this and we're seeing pipeline breaks all over North America. We saw it in Kalamazoo with the Michigan spill which was three million liters. We saw it you know in other parts with the Kinder Morgan pipeline going to the west coast. We saw a spill there so people are very concerned. The UN has actually put forward recommendations regarding moratoriums on oil and gas in Lubicon territory. On March 26 of 1990, the United Nations Human Rights Committee actually ruled that the failure to recognize and protect Lubicon lands has led to the ongoing threat of our way of life and culture. And also again in 2005, the United Nations Human Rights Committee cited Canada for violating the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in regards to the treatment of the Lubicon. So this is being documented by a variety of human rights committees and yet we still see this type of development happening. A week and a half to two weeks after the oil spill, massive forest fires took hold of the region and we still see forest fires still burning today out of control near the oil spill. And what kind of threat does this pose to local communities if we can't contain local forest fires or massive forest fires, as a matter of fact, near facilities that could potentially explode, that have exploded from some of these fires, or you know, by the leaks and the pipelines that we're seeing all across Alberta because of this infrastructure that needs to support the oil and gas. I think, you know, the reason I do this work is because of what's happening in my community. You know, we see a massive oil spill. We see, you know, wildlife and the ecosystems dying, you know, before people's eyes. We see a crisis in the northern part of Alberta because of tar sands development. And you know, going back home to deal with an oil spill and see how my family was being treated and how my family felt sick and was put, you know, in this threatening position of not even knowing what their rights were, what they could do to protect themselves, was utterly heartbreaking. How many more communities have to be threatened and how many more communities have to have their health put at risk for this type of development and who is it really benefiting? It's not going to benefit any of us in the end. What are we leaving to future generations? We're leaving contaminated water and contaminated polluted air and ecosystems that aren't going to be thriving. This type of development doesn't have to happen. We're talking about scraping the bottom of the barrel, you know, producing the dirtiest form of oil. And there are solutions out there. And we need to see a change in this world. And we need to push for renewable energy systems that help communities to actually be self-sufficient and self-sustaining. And 
we need to shift away from a fossil fuel based system and push for a renewable energy system that actually can help us transition out of what we are currently facing. <laughs>